Morning with your kids. Hola, Niho, Konnichiwa, Assalamu alaikum, Shalom, Mahaba, Morning, Maluanji, Namaste, Jambo, Bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted and so very honored that you are joining us in our mission to help all families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to tell all of your family and friends about the show, and please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Good Pod, Stitcher Radio, wherever you find your podcast. Our guest today is Cheatham Knebel. She is here to celebrate her Simple Words Decodable Chapter Books. Before we invite Cheatham into the studio, we want to let you know that this episode of the Reading with Your Kids podcast is brought to you by The Lost Colors by Sally Alexander. It's book number one in the Adventures of Caitlin and Rio series. This is a great middle grade novel. It's one, it's the first in a six book series. No one is more surprised than young Caitlin Mager when she wakes up to find her cat Rio talking to her. And the world around her suddenly is cloaked in grays without any colors at all. Caitlin and Rio are joined by best friends Molly and Trudy. Together they investigate the odd phenomenon and discover a much larger much more sinister plan is underway and it's up to them to stop it before it's too late a brilliant scientist a criminal mastermind world destruction come face to face with three clever girls and a talking cat in this thrilling adventure Kirkus Reviews describes the book as fun and fast moving a bright vibrant adventure you and your kids are going to love it it's The Lost Colors by Sally Alexander. This episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by Candlewick Press, publishers of Namaste is a Greeting, an absolutely beautiful picture book written by Suma Subramanian and illustrated by Sandhya Prabhat. While literally meaning I bow to you, the word Namaste has many different meanings. Not only is it a greeting or something you might say during yoga class, but it is a word used to describe the deepest of emotions. Namaste calms your heart when things aren't going right. Namaste is saying you matter. Discover many of its meanings with a young girl as she navigates a bustling market with her mother in this sweet and delightfully illustrated picture book. I can't think of a better thing to say to your kid than you matter. It's a beautiful emotion, and this is a beautiful book. It'd be a wonderful addition to your family library. Get your copy today. Namaste is a greeting published by our friends at Candlewood Press. Join us right now from the beautiful city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Our guest today is here to celebrate her Simple Words Decodable Chapter Books. Please welcome to the show, Cheatham Kniebel. Hey, Cheatham, how are you? Good, how are you? Thanks for having me. You're, you're very welcome. I am fascinated by um, by your website, Simple Words. There, you've created a, a, a library full of books to help kids with dyslexia. Am I right? That's correct, yes. Yeah. So tell us, how did you get started? Did you just wake up one morning and say, I want to write books that's, that's going to help uh, kids with dyslexia become better readers? Or was there another There's inspiration? <laughs> It wasn't that smooth, to be honest. So my son was diagnosed with dyslexia when he was six. So that was eight years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, as he progressed through his uh, OG-based training, which is um, a you know program that uh, helps kids learn phonics rules to be able to read in a very um, systematic and explicit way, he um, you know he started you know being able to sound words and decode and put sounds together. And he was so excited, and he said, oh, I'm going to read chapter books like my friends do. And I knew that he wasn't there yet. He still had to probably spend another year or so to be able to read those chapter books that his friends were reading, especially in the classroom. He still had to go and pick up those babyish books that were 24, 28, 32 pages. 
And I know he didn't like it. Mm -hmm. So um, I started writing for him so he could practice what he was learning. He could improve his fluency because, as you know, just like going to the gym, reading it, you know, you have to, um, you have to practice and get the automaticity of each word. And then it kind of goes to the long-term memory and it helps you build on the foundation of the earlier rules that you learn. So I started writing for him and I, I had a PDF in the car, always an extra copy, started giving to people. And, um, and then a very um, prominent um, school, dyslexia school in my region where my son was going to summer camp. Um, you know, I was asking them, like, where are these books? I can't find them. You know, there has to be, you know, someone who wrote these big kid books. There were, you know, books out there that were really, like, babyish. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he again, he really wanted something that he could hold. It had chapters. It was, it was that had a 100 to 120 page length. And, and they said, there's nothing out there. And I said, I'm writing for my son. That's like, very interesting. Nobody tried this. And they said, if you publish it, we'll buy it. And that was the time when, I said, hmm, is there an opportunity here? But I said, I'll do it when I retire. And I'm I'm an engineer. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not a writer by any means, or I wasn't, let's say that way. And uh, and I didn't want to really jump into that, um, knowing you know what it would entail. I tried to write a story in seventh grade, and my teacher said, oh, you know, it's not really good. <laughs> and that was kind of my, uh, you know, the end to my literacy world and I just said you know I find ease and comfort with numbers and I took the path to STEM and became an engineer and uh, and writing has never been easy but what I saw is you know when I have the drive and my bigger mission to help kids even an activity like writing could become my career yeah. and has become my career now my full-time job wow that's amazing well I kind of it, it kind of makes sense mm -hmm. because I'm Certainly not an engineer, but I'm. My daughter is engaged to an engineer, and through my work on the Solvit podcast, I've met many engineers. And one of the things I learned that no matter what branch of engineering you're in, the first step in engineering is figuring out what problem needs to be solved. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things you did with your son is okay. My son is starting to learn these rules, and we're going to get to the rules in a minute. But mm -hmm. you know, my my son is, is developing these skills, but now there's nowhere for him. The problem is there's nowhere for him to use those rules and mm -hmm. be successful. That that matches his interests, his his age and his interests. So you went out and you solved that problem. I get a question really frequently saying, like, well, how do you write? What's your writing process? Do you just sit and get inspired and the story comes to you? And I said, no, I think that's what traditional writers do. When an engineer like myself writes, uh, I almost like engineer the writing process because you know, I can't use a whole lot of words. And we'll talk about that, as you said. And when the pool is so narrow, I can't just write about any topic either. Like, uh, I always give this example, like kids want me to write about horses, but I can't write about horses because horse, stable, you know, the rider, those are all way above rules, very, very advanced rules, where um, by the time kids learn to read those books, those um, those words, they can read a, lot, read a lot of traditional books. So I have to you know, really stay within the lower end of the phonics rules that they read. Um, they ask me to write about soccer. That is huge. And I said, soccer, coach, field, game, I can't use these words. And if, you, if I can't use those words, I can't create a story. So I find a pool of words, the core words, that can make the basis of the story. And then I start building upon that. And if I really love something that's going to happen and I can't make it decodable, I said, sorry, I am not married to you. You can move on. I'm going to find another activity, another you know, another plot, another, you know, a, you know, a contrast that has to happen or a problem that the, you know, the hero has to solve. It has to be a decodable problem. And and I think a lot of authors have difficulty um, separating, you know, their um, their ideas and what they want to see in the book from the, you know, my purpose, which is really to make the book as decodable as possible. And it is, it is difficult. It becomes emotional when you're writing it. It becomes a part of you. Mm hmm and sometimes I have to put, put the book away for six months to think about what can happen. That what's that big conflict that they're gonna solve? Mm -hmm. 
that is decodable and it's not always easy. Yeah. And I think that's why there are so few books at the, um, you know, the word count that I write. Probably, yeah. As, you, as you're speaking, you're reminding me of a, a period in my life where, when I was touring Puerto Rico. I am not fluent in Spanish. I know a little bit. And the first time I t- toured Puerto Rico, I had my show translated into beautiful Spanish, and I tried to memorize it, and it was a disaster. So what I did is I came home, and I did what you did. I sat down, and I said, okay, what are the words in Spanish that I'm comfortable with? And mm-hmm. we're going to translate my show with these words. And there were a couple of magic effects and stories that kind of went out the window because I had to learn too many new <laughs> words. <laughs> it didn't fit. But, you know, getting back to the rules of phonics, one of the things that I've that, that we've discussed here on the show, and people have different, very different um, ideas. I had a guest come on who's somewhat controversial, who who is a teacher in Malaysia, and he said um, kids who speak Mandarin and write and read in Mandarin, there are no kids who suffer from dyslexia in Mandarin because it's a different. For, we we don't put. We, we don't, we're not decoding the Chinese characters, that mm-hmm. each Chinese character is individual and stands for its own word. And then we're, we're talking with other experts here in the United States, and one of the things that, they, that they've that they mentioned oftentimes is that one of the problems that kids with dyslexia have to deal with is that we have, we use over 46 different phonemes, pho, uh, yeah. you know, and... But we only have 26 letters. Mm-hmm. And those rules that we talk about, that we're like, oh, these are the phonics rules. It's like, yes, that's the rule, except for this exception, that exception. If you tried to build a building as an engineer with that type of foundation that, well, there, here's the rules and here's the foundation, except there's an exception here, an exception there, and have to, that building would fall down. So um, I will give hope because that that doesn't really sound too optimistic for a parent who's just <laughs> starting on their journey. So there are ways. Okay. It is not easy. English is one of the harder languages for dyslexic. That is true. Um, I would say, um, you know, in Mandarin, um, I wouldn't say kids are you know, not suffering from dyslexia. Dyslexia is all around the world. But because their language is not um, similar to English, I think the symptoms are not there and they're not as uh, influential on their day-to-day life. I speak three languages daily. One of them is Turkish. It does um, it does follow like a Korean, Japanese, Finnish kind of rules. It's very phonetic. Um, it is, um, I mean, it's. I, I would say um, kids do learn to read even though they're dyslexic um, a lot faster because there are um, almost no exception. Every letter except one has a single sound. Words don't, uh, letters don't come together and make different sounds. And there are almost no exceptions. There's only one letter that makes, that comes always after a vowel. Mm -hmm. And it makes a short vowel, a long vowel. So that's the only exception that I was, I, I can think about. But then there are, of course, other things that come with it. The fluency, the accuracy of reading because of the way the brain is, um, is wired. So there are, I, I think for a dyslexic, they're always dyslexic. It's a neurological. And regardless of your language, you know, there are challenges, but I 100% agree that there are languages that are a lot more dyslexia friendly, and English is not one of them. But but there are rules. I mean, I, I thought everything was an exception mm-hmm. when I first started looking into it, saying, oh my God, I don't even know how I learned this. And uh, and I realize that there are actually a lot of rules that that does apply to majority of the words out there. It's just you have to systematically and explicitly teach, and it does take a long time because, as you said, there's so many rules to teach. Yeah. Would it help a kid with dyslexia if mm-hmm. because I think a lot of kids with uh, who are challenged by dyslexia feel like they're a failure, like they have a problem, and this is a, a defect in me. Could it help us if, if we could sit down with our kids who are struggling with dyslexia and, and, and 
begin by telling them, look, this you're not broken. Mm-hmm. The language is kind of broken. And we just have to work harder because your brain thinks logically and you want your, your, your brain wants things to make sense. And this English language, it really doesn't make sense. So you just have to work. So, so it's not you. It's the mm-hmm. language. And you can learn these new skills so that you can deal better with this broken language. So I have a very strong opinion on that. Okay. And I understand every family is different. Every family's views are different. Values are different. And every child is different. The path that we have taken as a family is when my son was diagnosed at age six, we told him he's dyslexic. Not everybody wants to share this information mm-hmm. with their child because they feel like maybe they're, um, they're labeling their child. They're, you know, putting a um, name to something that they could possibly hide behind. Again, every child is different. My son was the one who actually said something is wrong. Mm-hmm. And that's why we started looking into it. And then we self-diagnosed ourselves and, uh, you know, I mean, I learned what dyslexia was, and I'm like, oh, my God, like, I I probably had this. But I had a very different, I mean, because I, I grew up in Turkey, and I learned Turkish, mm-hmm. um, you know, I my reading accuracy was quite high, but I had the comprehension, the fluency problems, and I also had, the, uh, you know, small uh, inaccurate reading with the, you know, small con- jun- junction words. So my husband, you know, as soon as he learned what it was, he's Norwegian, so that's a, uh, um, that's a language that is more similar to English. It's like, oh, I had this. I remember being pulled out. Nobody knew what it was. And now my mother-in-law said, oh, is, is, this is what dyslexia. I have it too. So it does run in the families. Mm-hmm. But I would be very careful about how we phrase it. Mm-hmm. It is not the English language, though. It's the way the brain is wired. Okay. So I would say, instead of saying, yeah, this is the English language, it's not you, I feel like it still sounds like there's something to blame. There's nothing to blame, Mm -hmm. right? It is just that they're going to learn differently. They all have their strengths and weaknesses. This has nothing to do with their intelligence. Mm -hmm. And and I would say you just have to, you know, learn it differently, probably work a little bit harder on this. But you know what? Some some people have to work harder on sports. Some people have to work harder on art. This is just another way the brain is wired. Yeah. See, that's why you're an engineer and you're, you've created Simple Words Press. Because you're much smarter than me. You're, you're able to look at the problem in a, in a different way. Thank goodness I'm not out there trying to build buildings or, or run a publishing house. So tell us a little bit about the books that we're going to find at Simple Words. So there are two different levels right now, and we're working on more advanced as well. Uh, the first one is the early readers. I will show them here. Mm-hmm. There are four of them sold in a book set in, on our website. Um, they're about two to 3,000 words. They're all single syllable and all CVC words that uses short vowels. And we are very uh, tight on the sight words we use. And sight words are words that don't follow any rules or they are not really learned by the, the, the rule to read that word has not been taught to the reader. So there are very few sight words, so they don't have to get frustrated because not every child learns the sight uh, words as easily as others. Mm-hmm. And and uh, and again, as I said, there are like two to three thousand words. All of our books are um, chapter chapter books, and uh, except a few that I wrote earlier, where I didn't realize that um, a you know a reader who's not very eager to read would be kind of looking through the books and saying, when is this chapter gonna end? Mm-hmm. So, you know, the chapters are, you know, a couple of pages long, and the font is a little bit um, bigger as well in these books. The other books that I have is a novice level, uh, and there are 11 books in it. I have a few of them here. Uh, Sand is Stuck is the first one, and then we have all different ones, different genres. I have uh, fantasy, um, realistic fiction, adventure. There are ones about, um, you know, animals. There are ones about, you know, kids helping cops solve a, a test and a mystery. Um, you know, there there's some about more, you know, like bullying and a little bit more like Disney drama. So I try to make different genres because not every kid likes a certain genre. Mm-hmm. So they can find something they they enjoy. And those books are, um, Seven Stack is the shortest one, which is the first book I wrote. Is about you know four thousand plus. They mostly range between six to eight thousand words, and they're all about hundred four pages. Well, that is certainly a, a, a those are certainly books that are going to give uh, a kid in first, second, or third grade a lot more confidence. Uh, 
yes. than going back and reading picture books that they were reading in kindergarten. Correct. And if I can, like, maybe just show um, inside of a book, this is our latest book, King's Ring. I mean, uh -huh. you can see this is a real big kid's book. Yeah. And, I'm, and I love that I have, um, I, I love getting the photos of kids who, I, there's a certificate of accomplishment in the back. Ah. And, you know, because this is a big accomplishment. Sure. This is a big thing for, uh, you know, a beginner dyslexic reader to accomplish. I have, you know, color copies of, the, of these certificates on my website. At the end, I have um, a word list for every single book. So they can say, oh, you know, this might be still too high up. Or, oh, maybe this book is easy. Or, or this is the right level. Because it is very important to find the right level of books. And I don't say that these books should be used to say, oh, well, they read these well with fluency. The kid has has succeeded in reading. That is not the goal. This is a step in between traditional books that are millions are out there to the early readers that are only, as, as you said, like, you know, 24 to 36 pages, right? right? So I want this to be in between books where they practice their fluency, they gain confidence. That's a very critical age between like second, third, fourth grade when they're just discovering what reading for fun is. Yeah. Well, I'm, and I want them to have these resources so that they don't tell that story. I don't like reading. I don't like books because actually the reason why they say that is because they can't read it. That they don't, not that they don't like reading. Right. And that's my biggest goal to build that love of reading and the confidence at a very critical age. And we don't tell ourselves those limiting beliefs that as adults we come to believe. Right. And, and I think that that's really where we lose a lot of kids. Yes. You know, and that 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 transition from being read to to becoming an independent reader, reading those those chapter books, and yeah, if a kid in second grade feels like oh, I can't do this, I'm not a reader, they're they're, they're going to you know equate that with not liking books, yeah. and um and, and and we have to because I think most kids coming out of kindergarten they're real excited they you know mm -hmm. they they associate reading with snuggling up with their parents or listening to their favorite teacher all these really great feelings and we don't want them to then turn and start associating re reading with struggle and failure and feeling left out yeah. and another thing that's very important in comprehension which is really why we read like somebody can read fluently but if they don't understand what the words mean comprehend it, then there's no really um, value in reading or reading fast. So in my books, I also try to, you know, pick words that could be new to them to build their vocabulary. And that is really hard to do in those really short picture books. They always like use the same words over and over again. And, you know, I always support audio books or, you know, reading out loud by, a, by an adult, because that is really important to build the vocabulary. So as they start, um, you know, the learning more and more advanced phonics rules, and they're able to decode those words, they actually have that vocabulary built. And I think that is a huge part that many people over overlook as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if there was one message out there to um, a parent whose child has been diagnosed with dyslexia, it's the beginning of the school year, and they might be just terrified, what mm -hmm. would you tell that parent? I will say it will be okay. They will all grow up to be, you know, happy adults if they get the emotional support they need. Learn anything you can about your rights, the IDA law out there, and what your school district offers. And question, and once you learn all the rights you and your child have, then you can become an advocate. And I think unless you become an advocate, and unless you're very lucky to be living in those few districts that truly want to support the children, then you, you have to go out there and fight for uh, what the child needs. Yeah. And I'm not saying, you know, the school districts and teachers don't want to help the kids, but they don't have the resources. And, you know, especially after COVID, the teacher shortage out there, the resource source sh uh, shortage out there has made the situation even worse. Mm -hmm. I think we will see a lot of kids who are not dyslexic, who will be struggling readers uh, because of the pandemic when they didn't have the right instructions and the reading delays happened. 
Um, a lot of kids stayed home during summer where um, they could have been, you know, reading uh, books they probably didn't. Uh, you know, I, I know, you know, my son was spending more time in front of the computer playing games versus, you know, um, reading or going out and doing activities as a group. So I think we will see a whole other um, generation of kids coming through that are, who are not dyslexic and also struggling readers. And they have to be, I think, um, you know, um, nurtured with mm-hmm. the same way. And there is no, um, you know, it, it, it is a scientifically proven that if you explicitly teach a non-dyslexic the way the dyslexic read, they do become better readers as well mm-hmm. because they do learn the phonics rules. And as the words get bigger and longer, especially if like if you're going to medicine, those words are difficult. But if you know how to pronounce and you know the rules, it will be only helpful in the future to all those who are not dyslexic. Yeah, yeah. And 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 I and another area that I was never intentionally you know targeting, but they found me was the English as a second language. Ah, yes. And there are a lot of kids who come here as uh, as an older. You know, they're not going to kindergarten. They're coming maybe in, you know, uh, upper elementary or maybe even middle school. And they want to read exciting and interesting books as well because they're older and their interests and in their native language they were already reading those mm-hmm. books. Mm-hmm. And and I and I wasn't intentionally again you know writing for them, but I I hear wonderful stories, who um, from you know teachers and parents who give their um, you know just beginner learners these books, and they say, well, they're excited about the language, they really want to read more. Yeah, you know, you just ra- reminded me we we've hosted international kids here in our homes for many years, and. One of the first kids was uh, she wasn't a kid. She was a medical student in Italy, and mm-hmm. she came over and with limited English skills, and she was very excited to learn English, and she loved to read, and she was frustrated. Um, mm-hmm. My daughter is about the same age, and you know when she was picking up books that my daughter was reading at, uh, my daughter was eighteen. Um, they were just way over this mm-hmm. young woman's comprehension level, and I said, uh, "Why don't we try some middle grade novels?" Yeah. You know, that, and uh, it, and just read it while you're in the car and we're driving around. And and she loved it, and she came to a word that she didn't understand. We would, you know, mm-hmm. decode it for her, and um, it was amazing uh, that, that she was still able to fall in love with stories, read stories that that she really enjoyed, that was very entertaining, and develop, you know, uh, really improved her English. That's a great story. Yeah, yeah. Hey, it would be wonderful right now if you could tell us a really simple way for us to find out more about Simple Words and find out more about you. The best way to find about uh, us is on our website, simplewordsbooks.com. That is, uh, words and books are plural, simplewordsbooks.com. We have three resources um, you know, you can you can always email me knebel k n e b e l at simplewordsbooks.com. I I respond to everyone who reaches out to me. Um, if you have our books or if you will get our books for your student teacher uh, your um, children, um, encourage them to write letters to me. I write back and uh, and I think it just gives them one more encouragement to say, oh my God, I know the author mm-hmm. and I think they feel special. On our website, if you buy our books. There is a, if you go into each book and add it to cart, there comes a little note saying if you want it autographed, I autograph all the books that you want uh, for free. I don't charge extra because I know that um, that is also one more excuse for a child to pick up the book. And what we have seen and what we have heard is if they can get through the first eight pages, maybe 10 pages, they kind of realize that they can read these books successfully. And they continue. So my goal is to um, give them one more reason for them to pick up the book and start turning the pages. Wonderful. We've had a really fun and and really fascinating time speaking to the driving force behind simplewordsbooks.com. Cheatham Kinebo. My friend, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest would be Maya Smart. She'll be here to celebrate Reading For Our Lives, a literacy action plan from birth to six. This is a really important conversation. You don't want to miss it. 
Hey, you also don't want to miss a single episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast, so please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app on Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Good Pods, Google Podcasts, uh, Stitcher Radio, Himalaya. Wherever you find your podcast, you can find the Reading With Your Kids podcast. We'd also love it if you could connect with us on social media, facebook.com slash reading with your kids, at reading with your kids on Instagram and TikTok, at Jedly Magic on Twitter. And of course, we would love for you to visit our website, readingwithyourkids.com. Sign up for our free online magazine. And also, please do use the contact button at the top of the page if you want to let us know what we're doing well, want to let us know what we could be doing better, and want to let us know who you would like to hear on an, on the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, we're going to start by thanking our guest, Cheatham Canebo. Please be sure to check out her wonderful website and her Simple Words books. I also want to thank our sponsors, Sally Alexander and The Lost Colors. We also want to thank our friends at Candlewood Press. Please be sure to check out Namaste is a Greeting. I want to thank my team, Fatima Khan, Rory Grady, Jordan Saley, Mirabella Q, Skylar Strauss. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of The Reading With Your Kids Podcast.